So good evening from an unspecified place in Ukraine. I have the honor to be here today with Timothy Judah. If you could maybe briefly introduce yourself. Uh, thanks very much. I'm a British journalist. Um, I've been covering Ukraine uh, for quite a long time. I'm on and off. And I'm here on a reporting mission right now for the New York Review of Books. So just to get you in the picture of what's happening, we've been deployed on a humanitarian mission and uh, Tim joined us on it. And on the way there, we've been uh, we've hit a series of unfortunate events, to put it mildly. Uh, few, how do you, how how would you say our our car broke down several times, but that we still overcame. Unfortunately, about four kilometers before our final destination, we ran into this uh, local tradition in this time of the year in Ukraine called uh, Rasputitsa, which is essentially extreme mud. And one of our cars just got stuck there. We managed to pull it out several times with our other car. However, at one point, <laughs> the right rear wheel broke off. Like everything was going wrong and uh, it was getting dark. So we didn't manage to hit our final destination. But um, so we turned around for a bit and found found shelter in this uh, in this uh, abandoned house, which is likely uh, to to have been abandoned due to war, and uh, we don't we we don't know who lived here. Obviously, there's some there's some uh, people who we'd like to thank later because if it wasn't at his house, we'd be in serious trouble. But to go on with the interview or with the with the talk, let's say, uh, what are you covering right here right now? Well, I've been here for almost a month, and um, because the New York Review does these sort of long reportage pieces, I've got to write a very long reportage piece um, at the end of this month. So um, I had envisaged or this coming to the border with you and uh, uh, going to a place which would be otherwise inaccessible as some um, part of my uh, piece, and it will still be part of my piece whether we get there or not tomorrow. But that's what I'm doing, and I've been in, um, in, in Lviv, in, in Odessa, I went to Kherson, uh, Mykolaiv, and, uh, and now here. So what are your first impressions of today, <laughs> or your general impressions of today? Uh, well, you know, like as a journalist, you never learn nothing. So you're constantly learning stuff. So that, that's the first thing. Of course, it's frustrating that we didn't get to our target. Um, but, you know, hopefully we'll be able to get there tomorrow. But, you know, as, as I say, you, you're always learning something. And just by looking out of the window, you're seeing stuff, you know, fields which have been ploughed and fields where there's stuff uh, rotting, rotting, which hasn't been harvested, uh, sunflowers we saw uh, today. You know, it, it all tells you something. And even when we were stuck in, in, in that field, suddenly, you know, it was completely dark. You know, along comes a, comes a big armoured uh, vehicle, um, BPM, Ukrainian think, army. Yeah. yeah, an infantry fighting vehicle. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, it was fascinating just, just to be there and think, the question was like, people might be watching, thinking, well, what were you doing driving across these fields? Right. I mean, and the answer is apparently because uh, the, the normal route to uh, the place we were trying to go to along the Russian border um, are visible from the Russian side of the border. And the Ukrainians and Russians are kind of lobbing artillery across the border at each other. And um, apparently it's dangerous because, you know, you, you could be a target uh, along that road visible from, from from Russia. That's why we were taking no risks and going along this um, these um, well-worn, as you said, very muddy tracks straight through the fields. And that's why we got stuck. And um, uh, how would I say, um, when, when the, like, for me personally, when the armored vehicle approached, you know, me, uh, I, I, I felt like a child all of a sudden, you know, it's a, to see a, it's, it wasn't a tank, it was an armored vehicle, but it's massive, the cannon and everything, and even the, the respect you get from the soldiers, or, you know, it's this, it's this uh, how would I say, you know, you, you suddenly realize really quickly, that even uh, we were actually asking uh, the soldiers that if there if there's any other way to go around and the soldiers were sort you know sort of poking fun at us they're like uh, well no this is the only supplying route route obviously we're in war so it it, re it really hit me there you know that uh, you're on a road and there's this armored armored vehicle like launching at you you did, did you did you feel anxious or or anything like that 
No, I felt disappointed because I was hoping they were going to tow the broken <laughs> car to the to the village. That's what I, I was hoping they would just turn around and, and help us. But um, apparently they had other things to do. So uh, they, you know, they they gave some advice. They told us, you know, this is the only way to go. But um, you know, no, I felt I felt disappointed to tell you the truth. I was really hoping they were going to help us out and tow us. And uh, how long are you intending to stay in Ukraine for? Well, I've been here for like almost um, three and a half weeks. I mean, my plan was to stay here a month, so I'll stay here more or less a month. I'm, I, I'm kind of, I'm finishing this, um, this this reportage trip, and this was going to be the sort of last sort of big kind of, you know, out in the field bit. I've got yeah. one or two kind of, uh, kind of um, sort of formal interviews to do in Kiev, and then and then that's it. Actually, I've got so much stuff. I, I only want to do two interviews when I get to Kiev, and then really? and then that's it. But I mean, you know, I need this sort of color. To sort of you know bring it home to people to, I mean to um, how shall I put it to, you know to 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 ex to explain to readers what it you know what it looks like feels like smells like uh, uh, um, you know and 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 in, because I'm writing this long reportage piece like you know it's not just the sort of kind of daily news um, I'm, not, I'm not doing that I just have to be sort of to, to it has to be different and uh, and, and sort of a, a more in depth and and as you can you know as you can, not as you can see but I mean there are no other journalists here and so I'm I'm doing stuff that other people are not doing at the, I mean at least mm. in in this pit I'm, I mean when I had the opportunity to do, to go to Hassan obviously there were lots of lots of journalists but I mean here is an opportunity to go and see and do things and, and report on something which um, other people um, are not doing I mean for example it hit me. You know the the reason why we're going to this village. You know, really hit me when we were in 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 the field, taking you know with this whole whole kind of um, van full of bread uh, and other things, is and, and when we got stuck there, we realized, well, you know, that's why they're really in trouble in this yeah. village because mm -hmm. they they can't get it. Otherwise, it's you know you think well, why can't they get the stuff themselves or why can't there's, there's just like no simple way to get there and that's why they're. They're, they're really isolated up there on the mm. Russian border. Mm. As I said, the road is dangerous. Uh, the only way to get there is through the field. And, you know, they're obviously running out of, out of supplies. I mean, I don't think they're going to starve. I think kind of most kind of little villages in, in Ukraine, you know, most people have got sort of stores of food and uh, stuff. But still, there are lots of sort of things that which, they, which they need. Just some basic things like bread. You know, mm. That's what's in, in the back of the van. I hope it won't be too long before we get there, otherwise all the bread will be stale. <laughs> Uh, just to specify, there's no signal or uh, internet connection. We're very lucky to find a house. There's actually electricity in, so we managed to put on some heating. I mean, you say that, but luckily when we arrived, as far as I've understood, it was like there was no electricity until a few hours ago. It'd been off for days. Oh, which, yeah. So and, we're really lucky because I think in this house, we've got a, plugged in an electric yes. heater, which was here. Otherwise, we'd be freezing. And a blackout can obviously happen <laughs> exactly. any time. They've been happening uh, yeah. even in huge cities constantly. It's become an unfortunate routine in Ukraine lately because that's one of the um, uh, strategy of the occupant forces to wear down the willingness to resist and uh, basically torture the local communities with winter, I mean, with cold mm -hmm. and and um, isolation, as you said. What are some of the findings you, you, you've had in the last three weeks? I mean, I, I, as I said, I've been coming quite, quite regularly. And I think that what's really interesting is that I was here in 2014-15 um, and then um, uh, um, and then I then I came. Well, actually, I came at the beginning of the year. I came in January, and then I say from January to April. So the invasion began on February the twenty fourth. So you have these in in my mind. There's three kind of periods to to describe. So there's that period of the time of the revolution, two thousand and fourteen, fifteen, and the the beginning of the invasion when when the Russians took Crimea and they took the first. Um, chunks of Luhansk and, 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 and Donetsk, in which period, you know, Ukraine and, and Ukrainians were chaotic, disorganized, it was coming out of a revolution, um, and um, the army especially was, you know, in a very bad shape, which is why kind of volunteer brigades were sort of formed and, mm -hmm. you know, and helped stop Russians in 2015. But still, Ukraine was very weak. And what struck me when I came in, in, in January and in the weeks before, leading up to the invasion was um, I realised how I had not realised, but I don't think anybody outside of Ukraine had realised. And I think above all, I don't think Putin and the Russians had realised how 
incredibly, uh, Ukraine had changed between 2014-15 and 2008. It was kind of organized, much more united, um, uh, and, and prepared. However, I must say that on the eve of the invasion, very few people believed it was going to happen. I mean, like... You Were know, you here, actually? I was here. Yes, I was here. I came on January. I came in at the end of January, and then um, I was. Um, I did a big piece, literally, which I filed just before the invasion started, um, sort of like hours before. Um, and you know, wherever I went, including Kharkiv, where we started today, I mean, it was complete denial. I mean, people said, "Of course, there's not going to be an invasion. Like, what rubbish!" I mean, I remember there was a aggressive woman in Kharkiv, Kharkiv Market. And she uh, said, um, she she shouted at me, going, "Have you got a brother?" And I said, "Well, yes." She said, "Would your brother attack you?" And I said, "Well, no." She said, "No." So of course he wouldn't. So of course Russia's right. not going to attack us. I think that was very very common. Uh, and then uh, that was in sort of ordinary market. Then there's the sort of more fancy um, up market, um, covered market with sort of fancy food shops and called the Sumska market. Mm -hmm. And I went in there. And I had help with that. I was with a tr translator, and we started going from, you know, place to place, asking people, "Do you, well, do you think there's an invasion about to come?" I mean, you know, this was February up. To, this was about February the eighteenth, nineteenth. So it was like we're talking like week, like a, less than a week before the invasion, and everyone goes, "Nah, of course no, not. It's not." No, 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 no. And then I, I just said to to my translator, "Let's give up," because everyone was saying exactly the same thing. So I mean, there was this denial, but still. Behind it all, there was, there had been, I mean, Ukraine had really yeah. changed a lot. And then I think, uh, then on February the 24th, I was in um, Kiev, and then I covered all that period, the beginning of the invasion, and I, then I was covering Bucha and Irpin and, uh, and all, you know, all, all, of, all of that period. And what was interesting was that there was this kind of, um, the morale was extremely high, but there was a kind of euphoria. And now, you're asking me like what's changed. I think what's interesting is that what's changed from that period is that morale is still very high. Mm -hmm. and, and so it should be like 50% of the territory which had been taken off in, in the first weeks of the war has been, has been taken back. And, um, uh, and, and the West has been incredibly and surprisingly united. So morale is still very high. But what a lot of people have said to me is how um uh, how the, the one thing that has changed behind this high morale is they say it's now it's personal meaning that so many people have lost somebody that they know mm -hmm. they've lost mm -hmm. colleagues or if they're soldiers they've lost other they've lost they've lost Thanks. comrades in arms but so now it's it's not just a sort of defending ukraine and, and, and doing the right thing it's, it's 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 that plus the personal thing of you know I don't want to say revenge, I mean, that's not the, the right word, but it's just that, I mean, well, they put it on as well themselves. It's personal. Yes, yes. So um, you spoke on, you, you talked about mental resiliency of the nation. And actually, uh, me and my colleagues from Team for Ukraine and Maidan Monitoring Information Center, we, uh, we are here to monitor war crimes. Yes. What, uh, what are your, or I don't, uh, how, how to state it? Not opinions or feelings, or actually, yes, opinions and feelings about the atrocities and uh, the horrible behavior of the of the Russian army or the occupant forces that are here, and um, yeah. I mean, I've covered other wars before, and um, is it comparable? I mean, in, in I mean, in general terms, there are superficial comparisons, and then you sort of dig deep. I mean, no. But I mean, for example, I, you know, I covered all the Balkan wars. So in, in Bosnia uh, and, and, in, and in Croatia, you know, there were a lot of, uh, well, I mean, obviously war crimes were, 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 were prominent. Um, but a lot of what's happened here, I mean, a lot of what strikes me, a lot of what's happened here strikes me as, uh, um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's self-defeating anyway. It's, it's mm -hmm. completely self-defeating because all it's done is it's kind of united kind of re Ukrainian um, resolve. But I mean, I, I, I mean, I actually having been talking to your 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 your, your colleague um, Petra Poyman, where he's he's his has his theory of the sort of um, the how how uh, 
Deviation. Did, well, what I want to say was the, the absorption into the sort of military and, and state mainstream of of, of literary criminal elements. Mm -hmm. You know, a commander in chief who spent time in the army. You've got the head of the sort of Wagner group who was also a kind of former criminal. I mean, and and, and bringing it and recruiting many criminals to 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 fight, um, who have little moral scruple, but also little kind of you know military training either. So I think there there is that that element as well. Um, which does explain the sort of, you know, irrational and, well, to, to us, kind of irrational and sort of uncontrolled kind of violence. And, and what's interesting is it's, it's, not, it's not everywhere, because you do go to some places and then not much happened. But then you had in, in, in places like in, in Bucha especially, this kind of, I mean, I, I, irrational... Un in, in, in kind of uncontrolled, yeah, ex exactly. I mean, it, it's not because it's like, some of it was kind of, how, how should I put it, some of the, w w I think some of it grew out of a kind of paranoia. I think a lot mm -hmm. of it is grew out, especially in those early days, grew out of the, the, the Russians were absolutely paranoid because of people using their phones, reporting positions. I mean, but fine, but you don't have to then go and murder people because of yeah. that. But I think that's partly what they were doing, was that they were seizing people and, and, and grabbing their phones and, and murdering them as a sort of way of, you know, discouraging others from re reporting positions. But I mean, you know, that's a, a war crime is a war crime is, is a war crime. But, you know, in in the end, a lot of war crimes are irrational and, um, and um, how shall I put it, uh, they, they, they don't serve, they, they serve to uh, only bolster the, the enemy. Mm. Uh, and, and that's what they've done in, in Ukraine, instead of bolster, bolster resolve, uh, I think. So essentially, if I understand it correctly, yeah. It's a both combination of uh, the um, uh, momentary paranoia or yeah. frustration and a reflection of the nature of a kleptocratic or criminal uh, regime that uh, that the Kremlin runs. Oh, oh yes, and, and and an army which is sort of you know hasn't been trained for this. I mean, yeah. a lot of these people, are mobilized people, have no military training, and perhaps some of the Russian army has. Poor Russian, poor military training, but in principle, so soldiers are supposed to be educated about what is a war crime and what's not a war crime, etc. I mean, but I mean, you know, all war crimes happen in, in all wars, but I mean, a lot of what we've seen is just is kind of irrational and kind of what, what, what widespread. Since you've covered more wars out of experience, uh, yeah. at what point of the war do we find ourselves now, or what can we expect in the no, that's, future? That's like us, that's, a, that's a crystal ball question, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, one thing about this war has been so many predictions have been just completely wrong. So I'm just not going to say this is this is going to last for two months, or this is going to last for a year or five years. I've, mm -hmm. I, I have no idea. I mean, look, you know, on February 24th, people who did predict a war correctly. And the intelligence told us it was going to be a war. I mean, it's like, this is a lot of people didn't want to believe it, yeah. but the people said, you know, a lot of, you know, experts were saying, this is going to last three days, and, you know, Ukraine's going to collapse. And of course, of course it didn't. And then they, a lot of experts keep making things, making predictions and yes. analysis, which proved to be wrong. I mean, the, the chief of the general staff, US general staff, Mark Milley, was saying, um, uh, the days in the days before her son fell, oh, this could take weeks. You know, even if the Russians are going to leave, it could take them weeks to sort of withdraw. I mean, I mean, if the chief of the U.S. the U.S. chief of general staff doesn't know, uh, you know, then like, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, and there are so many un unpredictable elements as well. But at the same time, we do see the Russian regime going uh, into isolation, being. Uh, constantly sanctioned by the rest of the world and uh, basically well, it's not sanctioned by the whole it. yeah mm, yeah but that's the you're because you're looking at it from a european perspective uh -huh. you're looking at it if you're sitting in china or if you're sitting in india or mm -hmm. if you're sitting in, in in africa or other large parts of the world it, mm, it doesn't look like that and that's what the, the russians keep saying well it's not the whole world is kind of as against us I mean, the Chinese and the Indians might be a bit uncomfortable, but they haven't put sanctions. They could do a lot, mm -hmm. but they haven't done it, have they? That's true. So, mm -hmm. um... so it's not. Yeah. So it's not the isolation, complete isolation. I mean, it's isolation from an important economic, an important. Sort of... But is there a way back for Russia at all? You know, into 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 state pre-war. 
Well, you know, not, not with uh, Vladimir Putin as president, mm -hmm. for sure. You know, and not uh, not with Vladimir Putin, uh, 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 and 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 not occupying large parts of Ukraine, for sure. No. But I mean, who knows? I mean, we we don't know what's going to happen. And I mean, a lot of Ukrainians, interestingly, people don't talk about this so much in in Britain or or America, as far as I know. But a lot of Ukrainians think actually the end of the war is isn't going to be decided here as much as. In, in, in Russia itself. In a sense, people here have a historical vision thinking, well, you had the, the First World the first world War in, 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 you know, provoke the revolution in, in Russia, and, and that's what changed things here. And then what led to independent Ukraine was collapse in, collapse of the Soviet Union. It was also something, it was something external to, 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 to to, to what was happening here, well, that's that's wrong. It's not, it's not quite what I want to say. It's like there are the people, many people, I think, think that the the final end is going to be like a third unexpected thing, like like the Russian Revolution, like the collapse of the Soviet Union. It will be something provoked by this war, but unpredicted, and and and, and will ch will mean lead to change in Moscow. But I mean, I don't know, you know. And but that's what I've, many people have said to me already. Maybe last question to conclude the interview. As a British journalist, could you maybe give us some input how you feel the general British public views this conflict in, in the in Russian aggression? I'm mean, nothing pretty, pretty solidly uh, pro-Ukrainian. I think very much so. I mean, uh, the the one thing that I uh, I think it needs to be said, you know, from a journalistic point of view. It's not, from no other point of view, is that because some people ask me, well, what's different from all the other wars you've covered? And there is one thing which is different in this war, is that we as Western journalists, we can't cover the other side, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is a problem. I'm not saying, there's nothing to do with, it, with, with supporting one side or the other. It's just that normally in a, in a conflict, it's important to cover both sides. And we know what people are thinking. We know what's happening on the other side. And we don't. We don't know what's happening because we're not allowed to get there. The Russians won't give us visas. You can't get accreditation whatsoever. That's why there's no coverage from the other side. So everything is from, from, from this side. And there's nothing wrong with reporting from this side, but you know, it would be uh, useful journalistically and, and otherwise in order to do a report from, from, from the other side. But, it, but that's physically not, not, not possible. No, so. no and, and that's the big difference between this war and other wars. I mean, for example, during the Bosnian war, you could be covered one side in the morning and you could cover the other side in the afternoon. You could have a story saying, I mean, literally covering the same place on both sides and make a kind of complete picture. But you, you can't do that here. But what does that say actually about the Russian regime? Because it doesn't allow it to do it. It has this control on the narrative and it, uh, it stems out of the hybrid warfare and uh, information control they've been doing prior to the, in, in the build up to I mean, up until I think that part of it is, well, I mean, either they, I suppose if one says they don't, they don't care, maybe, perhaps that's part of it. But some of it is, is, is I mean, look, a lot of this stuff, what they're doing is not logical. And you can't logically explain it because you've got to be in in their heads to understand it. But I think that um, when I say that a lot of it is not logical, we can assume that life is not great on the other side, and that people are being killed, and, and perhaps presumably some civilians are being killed on the other side as well. And you know, the, the, well, I don't know, but we'll be good to report that. That's what they keep saying. If you read their their media or their their people that, um, how shall I put it, people, the, the sort of activists, etc., who, who, who purport, the few activists, Western activists who purport to be journalists, who are not really journalists, on the other side, they keep saying, well, Ukraine's doing all these terrible things, etc. Well, you know, it may or may not be doing a bit, we don't know, because we can't report it, so, you know, but it would be logical, if it was true, that they would let us um, report it. Uh, well, maybe it's not true. Maybe that's not why they, why they don't let us go. I mean, but I don't know because I can't go there. We can't go there. Well, thank you, Tim, for the interview. For the, okay. for the Thanks moment. for having it's, me. Thanks for bringing is, me on this it's, trip. Uh, it's been really fascinating. <laughs> it's been an incredible honor and pleasure both to meet you and to have the interview with you. So um, thank you very thank much. You so well, much. Thanks for bringing me along. Thank you. <laughs> okay.